Well, uh, let me start off this series. Uh, I'm doing a new series for the month of November, and always in November, I always kind of bring a series around this topic. And because I, I don't know, I think um, fall for me is my favorite season of the year. I don't like the cold, but I do like the change of season. And, uh, you know, I know you northerners, northerners are laughing at me for saying it's cold outside, but it is a little bit for me. And, but I like the change of season a little bit. I like the holidays. I like Thanksgiving. I like being around family. I like the football in the fall. I like all the pumpkin spice lattes and all the pumpkin at Starbucks and uh, everything's pumpkin, you know. And um, I like all that. And, and, and it just, because it does something else for us. It brings out, it brings out the best in people, I think, the fall does. It brings out generosity in people. And it brings out Christmas and the holidays. I see, it, I see a lot of things that happen that usually don't happen throughout the year. And so I want to introduce to you this series for this month. It's called Treasure. And uh, I kind of want to update you on what we did last week as a church. Uh, last week was Love Our City, and that's uh, one event that we do every year. We ask everyone to be a part, and we send teams out. Hundreds of people go out in teams on one day. And let me tell you what we did last weekend here at East Coast Believers Church. 250 pairs of brand new shoes were given to Orlando uh, Children's Church, and we served there. 70 care packages were given to the homeless with food and toiletries and all that. 40 complete uh, Thanksgiving, uh, not just a meal, but uh, for the whole family were given away to an elderly complex. Um, completely stocked a school food pantry, Was worked with some seniors, cleaned and restored a local lake, um, cleaned and landscaped a local school and all their grounds, pressure washed, worked at the pregnancy center. Uh, we uh, worked the Special Olympics, and we actually did a lot of things there. But one thing we did was pulled, we pulled a plane for a fundraiser. And I want you to know your East Coast Believers team, we beat the Orlando SWAT team on that. Uh, pulled that plane. It was great. Um, <laughs> Um, painted and um, uh, we painted a Christian help and organization the outside of their building, inside of their building. The whole building got a remake over and uh, did Christmas gifts for them as well. Threw a big party for Boys Town and some other things. And I'm just so proud of you guys. And I just wanted to say thank you uh, for touching our community like you did. And, uh, you know, I, I want to set this series up with this story. And um, probably not a true story, but I heard it. I thought it was, would fit good in here. It's about this lady who was getting ready to die. And um, she to spoke to her daughter. She was a wealthy lady. She was a widow. She was getting ready to die. She spoke to her daughter and said, hey, before I die, hospice was called in. It's really important for me. Because she said, the, da the daughter said to her, mom, you can leave now. And the, and the mom said, I don't want to leave until one thing has to occur. She said, what? She says, please call up our attorney and call up the IRS agent that audited us. I want them to come and be here. So the daughter thought, well, that's kind of an odd request. And so she did. She called up the attorney. He came right away. And she goes, where's the IRS agent? And, uh, well, she's not here yet. And the mom says, well, I'm not going to leave until he comes. So finally, he came. And she got them there. And they were all curious as to why she would want this IRS agent and this attorney at, at her bedside when she was dying. And so she grabbed their hands and held them. And she said to her daughter, now I'm ready to go. She said, Mom, why? She says, well, I figured that Jesus died between two thieves and it worked for him and it's got to work for me too. And, uh, no, and I know there's attorneys that attend. I'm just having fun. But I, this series is about our treasure. And I want to talk about this because I also want to kind of give you a report of what's happened this year. But I also want to look at our possibilities as a congregation of the things that we can do more. I had, uh, Friday I had to give me some information and I wanted to give you guys an update of what you've done already this year. And through the first 10 months of this year, you have already given away to missions and to church planting and to benevolence. You have given away 200, a little over $270,000 this year to other ministries and organizations. I just, wanna, I just wanna brag on you a little bit because one of our core values of East Coast Believers is we wanna live our lives to make a difference. We wanna, we wanna live our lives to make an impact in other people's lives. And in fact, our vision statement's real simple. We wanna go reach people far from God. We want to grow in our relationship with God. And ultimately, our, my end goal for your life is this. If you're taking notes, write it down. I want you to give your life to the plan of God. 
I want us to be as general as possible, generous as possible, because at the end of the day, people are going to talk about us as a church. They're going to talk either good or bad about us, and they're going to, they're going to be talking. They're going to be saying something, and they could be saying, I don't care if they talk about our theology, our buildings, our programs, but they're out there in the community, and if they're saying, I don't know anything about that East Coast Believers Church, but I know they're making a difference in other people's lives. You could almost say it like this. I hope that if we ever have a funeral, if our church ever ceases to exist, we want people to weep at our funeral. We want people to miss that East Coast Believers Church is not part of the community. That was always the plan of God from the beginning. And one way we do this is we show random acts of kindness and uh, acts of kindness cards. We'll have them available for you. That's just when you... Out in the community, you want to buy someone's coffee, you want to, you know, leave a big honking tip today when you go out to eat, always leave a card that says, this is something a little extra to show you that God loves you. Always point them back to God. We've had tremendous results with that program that we've, we've done here. And to do this, I want to set it up with our launch verse. And I want, to, I want to show you a verse in the book of Timothy. Now, the book of Timothy was written by the Apostle Paul to a young minister named Timothy. And you got to, it's one of those books you've got to kind of break apart a little bit because some of the writing in the book was written to Timothy about his life and about his ministry. Other things Paul wrote to Timothy was to say, these are things that I want you to teach and preach to your congregation. And there's a verse, one of the verses he wanted them to teach was this. First Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17, it says this. Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud, nor to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Like how true is that? How we found out that our money really is unreliable. We live in a culture where, I mean, just five years ago, the real estate market was crashing and, you know, and now all of a sudden it's almost too expensive and, and then energy prices are up and down. Interest rates are up and down. I mean, this system, stock market's up and down. This system is so unreliable. He says, but your trust should be in God. And here's something you need to know about God, who richly gives us all the things that we need for our enjoyment. I mean, one of the biggest lies you could ever believe is that God doesn't want you to enjoy this life. God wants you to enjoy this life. Verse 18, it says this, tell them to use their money to do good. And this is what he said about us. They should be rich in good works. And, say it out loud with me, in what? Generous. He wants us to be generous of those in need. Always being ready to share with others. And like he said, instead of, instead of having an impressive stock portfolio or an, an impressive retirement account and all that, nothing wrong with all that. And instead of doing all that, I want you to be rich in good works. I want you to be rich in generosity. Verse 19 says, by, uh, by doing this, they will be storing up their treasure. That's the word we're going to focus on. Their treasure as a good foundation for the future so they may experience a true life. Now this is a bit like I know people think, what do you mean treasure for the future? Because I thought heaven and hell, that was a cross thing. That was a born again thing. That was a salvation thing. And absolutely, I want to be very clear. Your destination for eternity has nothing to do with what you do on this earth. That's all about what Jesus purchased on the cross, whether you receive him as your savior or not. But the Bible does say, by, doing, by being generous and doing good to others, there's a treasure that you store up in heaven for yourselves. In other words, there's some sort of there's some sort of reward system. It's not about getting to heaven, but once you get there, there's a reward system when you get to the other side about what you did on this earth for other people. And I think probably one of the, the best things that you could get out of this, these verses, and this is why I'm preaching it, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 19 says this, so that you may take hold of a life that is truly life. And what I want, well, my hope for you in preaching this series is so not only do you get a treasure when you get to heaven, that you're ready for heaven, you're not embarrassed when you get to heaven, but that on this earth you can experience, take hold of a life that is truly life. And so my basis for preaching this series, write it down, here it is, that you may experience true life, that you may experience what life is really all about. And I think, like one, 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 one author said, you have not lived until you can do something for someone who cannot repay you. And I think, People say, is this really a big deal? Like, is generosity and, and is l l being good to others, is it really a good deal? Making a difference in the life of other people? Legitimately, I think that's a, that's a good question to ask. It, should we even focus a series on this for two or three weeks? Like, why would we take time to do this? Well, if you go to the Bible, 
you'll find that there's, the, there's, there's some key words in the Bible. One of them is the word, the word that you probably would know about, the word um, uh, believe. The word believe, it's found 272 times in the Bible. Now here's another word that you probably think we should teach a lot on. The word pray, that's found 371 times in the Bible. Here's another word that I'm sure you think we should teach on. It's the word love. It's found 714 times in the Bible. Here's a word that you're probably shocked. The word give is found 2,161 times in the Bible because this is what God is all about. Like God's a generous God. Like, you know, I, in fact, I think the word give is the verb of the Bible. I think the subject is God and give is the verb and the object is us. Like God's a generous God who's in love with us. In fact, the famous verse that we all know it, John chapter three and verse 16 says this, for this is how God loved the world. Like he put action to his love. He gave, he was generous. He gave his only one, his only one, his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And the ideal is when you become a child of God that you become more like God. So that's, Thus, that's the impetus for this series. That's the baseline for this series. I want you to become more like God. I want you to experience true life. And I also want you to have a treasure when you get to the other side. Psalms 37 and verse 21 says it like this. The wicked borrow and never repay. But the godly, here it is, is that word, are generous givers. Proverbs 11 says it like this. The generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. And that's my goal. Like this is why I'm preaching this series is I want you to experience refreshing on this earth. I want you to experience true life. And I know there are people that are skeptical. If you've been to the church, you think, well, like what's he up to? What's the pastor up to? Let me just kind of lay it out there right now. There's no special projects we're doing. There's no, no fundraisers we're doing. You've already given. You've already exceeded. In the first 10 months, you've already exceeded by $70,000 what we budgeted to give away this year. You've already, and we're, we've got two more months to go. So we're already exceeding what our goals were for this year. That's how amazing you guys are as a church. And I want to say thank you for that. Yeah. And uh, so there's no, there's no gimmicks here. Like I, I really want you to experience true life. I really want you to have a treasure when you get to the other side. I really want you to be refreshed because the Bible says those who are help others are generous themselves will be refreshed. And to do this, I'm going to take a, a, a two chapters in the Bible. I want to do a verse by verse study of these two chapters. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9, those that are not familiar with the, the books of the Bible, Corinthians was a church. It was a, it was a church very much like the American church. It was a Western church. It was very prosperous, very educated, very much in tune with their culture. And Paul uh, wrote these two letters to them. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, he wrote a letter. Part of the letter, he's writing about this special offering. Paul had a heart for the church in Jerusalem. And Jerusalem was going through a tough time. They were kind of down and out, and they were struggling. And so Paul wrote this letter to the Corinthian church about taking up an offering for the church in Jerusalem because they're going through some difficult times. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and let's start reading here in verse 1. Now, I want you to notice the language. I want you to notice the internal plea of Paul. I want you to see the heart of it. And I bet you this is going to be very different than what you've heard probably about when it comes to being generous. I want you to see the Bible, what the Bible says about it. I want you to get rid of all your thoughts ahead of time of how you've been pre-programmed to think through church or whatever. I want you to see how God uh, talks about when it comes to being generous and it comes about your treasure. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and here it is in verse 1. Now I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. He starts off right away. He says, he's, he's kind of needling them. He's like, you guys are the wealthiest church and one of the other churches is even doing a better job than even you guys are doing. He's kind of just sticking it to them a little bit. I think, it, I, I think it's kind of funny, you know. And uh, in verse 2, he says this. They are being tested by many troubles, and they are very poor. But they are also filled with abundant joy, which has overflowed into rich generosity. Like only God could put all those words together in one verse. You've got troubles, many troubles. You're not just poor, you're very poor. But you have this joy, and now you're being generous. Like only, 
Only God could do something like that. And then in verse three it says this, for I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more. And they did it of their own free will. Like he said, you guys blew us away. You went way beyond what we ever expected of you. Kind of like what you guys do with Operation Provision and our House of Destiny. And uh, by the way, we got some new babies there this week in Guatemala. I'm so happy about that. And, um, and our, our, our Bible school graduates. All the things that you do planting churches in other cities. Like I, I'm always blown away by it. And then in verse 4 it says this, they begged us again for the privilege, like they're asking us for the privilege of sharing in the gift for the believers in Jerusalem. They did even more than we had hoped. For their first action was to give themselves to the Lord and to us just as God wanted them to. Like notice this, it wasn't just they gave themselves, it wasn't just money. Like a lot of us, we think generosity is just money. But they, notice this, they gave themselves. Generosity is not just writing a check. Take, here it is, right, once you write it down. Generosity is a lifestyle. Generosity is, being, is a lifestyle of giving. It's, it's sending someone a text. It's, it's giving someone a hug. It's, it's seeing someone on the side of the road and pulling over and helping them. It's someone going through a difficult time, taking time out of your schedule. It's not just generous with a check. It's generous with your life because generosity is a lifestyle. For God so loved the world, he didn't write a check. He gave a son. And that's what the American church has done. We've taken this generosity as just writing a check. And it's much more than that. Verse 5, it says this. They did even more than we had hoped. For their first action was to give themselves to the Lord and to us. Because this is what God wants. Verse 6. So we have urged Titus, who encouraged your giving in the first place, to return to you and encourage you to finish the ministry of giving. Since you excel in so many ways in your faith, in your gifted speakers, your knowledge, your enthusiasm, and your love from us, I, all, I want you to excel also in this gracious act of giving. Like he's, This is what he said, guys. Like no guilt, no shame, no condemnation, no pressure. Whenever God's involved in it, that's how it works. No guilt, no shame, no condemnation, no pressure. Can I get a good amen? Verse 8, I am not commanding you to do this. Like, God, come on. He said, I am not commanding you to do this, but I am testing how genuine your love is by comparing it with the eagerness of the other churches. And here's the ultimate motivation. I think the ultimate motivation, verse 9, for you know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that you through his, through his poverty he could make you rich. And that's not everyone gets to be a millionaire sort of thing. He's just saying Jesus left heaven. He left where, we, where they walk on gold. We use gold here in heaven. They walk on gold. He left all that, emptied himself, and came to this earth and did all of that because he loves you. You're like, that's the ultimate, to me, that's the ultimate uh, act of generosity. Verse 10, he said, now here's my advice. With all this, I want to give you some advice. It would be good for you to finish what you started a year ago. Last year, you were the first who wanted to give, and you were the first to begin doing it. Now you should finish what you started. Let the eagerness you showed in the beginning, they matched now by your giving. Give in proportion to what you have. Verse 12, I'll wrap it up with this. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. Here's what he's saying here. God is more interested in the attitude than the amount. God is more interested in the heart. Like when I read these, God is more interested in the heart. He's trying to show what should, what should be your true attitude concerning your treasure. What should be the true attitude concerning uh, your life and how you impact other people. And so I want to break it down and I want to show you through scripture like what the true attitude should be when it comes to being generous. Not just in your giving in terms of your money but in your lifestyle. And I just pulled out five verses out of here and kind of outlined this and showed you five attitudes that you should have concerning giving. Five attitudes you should have concerning generosity. Number one, here they are. I'm going to show them to you. These are just kind of a baseline for every arena of your life. Number one is we should give joyfully or have, we should have fun giving. Like we should go back to having fun when we give. That's why like I love 
acts of kindness, and we're going to have those cards for you out in the lobby if you want to take a couple. Like when you go and you give a big tip, it should be fun. When you go and help somebody and fill their car up with gas, it should be fun. When you're giving gifts to your family this year, it should be fun. Several years ago, about probably seven years ago, and we were meeting in the other building on 436, and we were doing multiple services, and, and we were doing three services on a Sunday. And so our team came to me, and they said, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to, you know, we're growing the church, and we're trying to figure out how to manage all these people, and one of the things that we, we could do to fill up that last service is that we want to get the word out that we're here, and we want to be generous to people in the community, and so we want to do these things called acts of kindness. I said, well, what's an, act of, what's an act of kindness card? And they said, well, you go out and you do something nice for people, and you leave them this card that points them back to God, and it says something to show you God loves you. I said, great, let's do it. And they said, let's do something really radical to kick off this, this campaign, Let's not only give everybody a card, let's give them money to go out and do it. And they, let's take our entire marketing budget, which is like a yellow page ad and all that sort of stuff, and let's just cancel it for the year. And let's take, it was like several thousands of dollars, I think it was like $7,000 or something, and let's just take that and give it to the people in the church on a Sunday. I said, okay, let's do it. So we had about 750 people, children and all got one of these, and we took we took about $7,000 and we went to, they went to the bank and they got some fives, tens, twenties, fifties, and hundreds. And they stuffed these envelopes, they shook them up, and they randomly put one on every seat that Sunday. And so when you went to church, there was an envelope on your seat, and inside there was either a $100 bill, $50 bill, $20 bill, 10 and 5 and so forth and so on. And, and we told people, go out to the community. So we gave away all that money that day, and it was, it was a lot of fun. Well, there was a lady that I didn't know until after. She came to me, and she said, I opened my envelope, and uh, there was a $100 bill in there. And she said, you have to understand, I haven't held a $100 bill in years. I didn't even know what to do with something like that. I, 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 she was serious. She said, I didn't even know they even made $100 bills anymore. She said, I put it in my wallet. She said, I didn't know what to do with it. And, uh, man, we had a great attendance next Sunday. We didn't do that every week from that on, that on, uh, ever again. And uh, it was a great, great next Sunday. A great, 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 great month that month. And, um, and so she said, I didn't know what to do with it. She said, then I was at Walmart. And, I, and, and one of the things I said was just pray and ask God where he wants you to do, what he wants you to do with this. She says, I was at Walmart. And several weeks later, and you've ever been, you know, it was on the one on 436. She said, I was lady in front of me. They rang up her groceries and it was time to pay. I noticed they were starting to put groceries back. She didn't have enough. She was, I knew right there that was my moment. That was my act of kindness moment. She was, I walked right up to the cashier and pulled that $100 bill out and I paid for those groceries. Now, this is a person who doesn't have a lot of money. She said, it felt so good. This is what the Bible says. When you give generously like this, you yourself will be refreshed. She goes, it felt so good. Well, the story's not over. She gave him the card, something to show you that God loves you just because. She goes, and it was so easy to give. It was so fun to give. Well, this lady who got this card, she shows up at our church a few weeks later. Because this lady told her, I don't usually have this kind of money, but my church gave her the money and told me to go do this, and so that's why I'm doing it. So this lady shows up and goes, I gotta get to this church and see what kind of church gives people money to go out and buy people groceries. And she just came to check us out. Well, here's what happened. She came to check us out, and at the end of the service, there was an opportunity given. If you're not, if you're, if you're not in the right relationship with God, this is your opportunity. Well, guess what she did? She got right relationship with God that day. Just because. Give joyfully. Second Corinthians 8 says it like this. That in the great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. I think we should remember the words of Jesus. In Acts 20 it says this. He said, remember the words of Jesus. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Do you know what I found out? The happiest people in the world are the most generous people in the world. The people that are generous are happy. The message translation reads it like this. Remember that our master said, you're far happier giving than receiving. Second Corinthians says it like this. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. Like don't give reluctantly, like two extremes. Give reluctantly or the other extreme in response to pressure. Why? God loves a person who gives cheerfully. Like God loves that. Proverbs says it like this. Some people are always greedy for more, but the godly, they love 
the godly love to give. I read this report. Is there a story out? And you can look this up on a science website. You can Google this. And uh, Wall Street Journal wrote this report, wrote this article about uh, people who give. And they did this study. A scientist did this study about people who give and people who, who don't give. And what they found out was they wired them up and they found out people who are generous, something, a chemical is released in your brain when you give. And not just money, but when you're generous with people, a chemical is released in your brain. And when this chemical is released, it goes right to the pleasure center of your brain. God, in the, it's incredible to me, in the complexity of the creation of the human body and the mind and the soul and all the chemicals and, and the brain, he created within us a release of a chemical in our brain that when we do something nice for someone, that we are actually get pleasure from it. It's what the Bible says, we are refreshed when we are generous. Number one, give joyfully. Number two, here's our attitude towards giving, to give selflessly. Like that's something that I, think, I don't think we talk much about anymore in our modern day church, but 2 Corinthians 8 says it like this. They even did more than we had hoped. For their first action was to give themselves to the Lord and to us just as God wanted them to. Like, like I, I love giving, and I, here's the reason why. Because giving is a part of me. When you give, it's a part of who you are. It's not just a check. Like I said, John chapter 3 and verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave a check. No, no, God, God didn't so love the world that he gave a check. He gave of himself. Like, that's really what giving is. It's, 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 an, it's an, an action where you give of yourselves. This letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians ends on this thought. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 15, he said, Thanks be to God for this indescribable gift. Like, all of us are impacted by the generosity of others. Did you know that? Like if you pulled up here today and you parked in a parking spot, someone made that, paid for that for you to get here. Like you've been impacted by someone else's generosity. If you came to church today and you drank a cup of coffee, somebody gave themselves about seven o'clock this morning and they brewed a thousand cups of coffee today, uh, early this morning in a kitchen so you could have a cup of coffee. If you have children and you dropped them off in the children's wing over there, somebody is, uh, gave an hour and 20 minutes of their time so you could be sitting in service today. If you're watching this video online right now, from all over people watch, and someone's behind a camera right now, someone's in another room on remote cameras, someone's on a switcher right now, someone's running the soundboard right now, someone gave themselves so you could experience what you're experiencing right now. Someone had to give of themselves. That's really what generosity, that's the heart behind it. I'm so glad that someone didn't say to me this morning, you know what, I don't do church work. Because if it was just me, we're in big trouble here this morning. I, I'm so glad Noah didn't go, I don't do boats. Aren't you? I'm so glad David didn't go, I don't do giants. But I'm really glad, I'm reading about Christmas right now, getting ready for that. And I'm so glad Mary didn't go, I don't do virgin births. <laughs> I'm so, aren't you glad Jesus didn't say, I don't do crosses? Man, I'm so glad a group of about six or eight people came and helped us start this church, and I'm so glad they didn't say, I don't do church plants. Because look where we are today because of them. I'm so glad our GO team says, doesn't say, I don't do church. Because we're here as a result that people gave of themselves. The third heart attitude towards giving is that we give willingly or because I want to, not because I have to. And if that's been your experience, and I just want to take a moment I'm almost done. I have eight minutes left with you guys. I, I want to say this. If that's been your heart for church, like people have abused that part and manipulated, I just want to say I'm sorry. I'm almost embarrassed sometime of my profession where we do that. And I want you to know that God wants you not to give under compulsion what he wants you to give willingly. 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 12 reads it like this. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has. Willingness. Like, like, and the question always comes up about this time, about this topic, when it comes to willing, willingness. The tithing question comes up. Do I have to tithe? Isn't tithing under the Old Testament? And I want to be really straight and open with you and honest with you and tell you, yes, tithing is under the Old Testament, and know that you don't have to tithe. 
Because you're not under the law, you're under grace. But when Jesus showed up, like when Jesus showed up, here's what I want you to know. He didn't come, he didn't show up to abolish the law. He came up to fulfill the law. He came up to fulfill the motivation of why you do it. The Bible says it, Matthew chapter five and verse 17 says this. Jesus said, don't be misunderstood why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish, accomplish their purpose. In other words, he said, I want you to go from external obligation to, are you ready? Internal delight. Like that's what he wants. He said, I want you to go from having to, because tithing's still in the Bible, in New Testament too, but it's no longer I have to, now it's I want to or I get to. Okay, so for instance, I'm married to my wife. We've been married 24 years. And the, do you know the Bible says under the Old Testament, under the law, thou shalt not commit adultery? How many know that's in the Bible? About two of you. <laughs> Next week we're talking about the Ten Commandments. They're still in the Bible, by the way. Oh boy, man. You seconds, sir. We're going to work on you guys. Uh, but how many know thou shalt not commit adulteries in the Bible? There you go. Man, it makes me feel better. Pastor Gwen, our family pastor, is really excited to see all those hands go up. But I don't, listen, what if I told my wife, I'm not going to run around on you, and I'm not going to cheat on you, just because there's these stone tablets that says, if I don't do this, God's going to get me. How many know that's the wrong motivation for not cheating on my wife? The right motivation is, I love you so much. I'm so in love with you. I want to stay true to you. And the motivation for giving and being generous under the New Testament, the New Covenant, is not because I have to, I'm just so in love with you. Number four, fourth attitude towards giving is this, is that we give, and this is the one that gets me the most, is that we give thankfully when you give. That giving is an, and, and being generous, our attitude is it's an expression of our worship. It's the most important for me because I am still blown away by God's kindness to me. I, I, you don't know this, but I, I, I can't believe all the stuff that we get to do. And I start talking, reading about Love Our City and the churches that we're planting and the things we're involved in and starting schools overseas and orphanage, all the stuff that you guys do. And, and when I read the numbers of almost 600 people born again in our services this year, like I still get blown away because I know me. And I know I can't do this. And I still struggle with this. I really do. I still struggle with every week. I still struggle. I wonder if anybody will even come to church today. I still think that sometimes, like they're not going to come. And so whenever people are here, I'm always blown away by God's goodness and kindness to me. And I, I don't give just because I have to. I don't even just give because I'm thankful. I don't even just give because it's what I'm supposed to do. I give because I'm blown away that God's hand would even be on my life. And you know, in the Old, Old Testament, they struggled with this. And they were delivered out of Egypt into the promised land. And God said, I, I want you to do a feast every year from now on to remember this. It's called the Passover feast. And Jewish people still do this today. And he said to them, and when your children ask you why, Exodus 13 says, in the future, your children are going to ask you, what does this mean? Then you will tell them, with the power of his mighty hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, the place of our slavery. Like, I want you to tell them. And when you, like when I give, when I teach my kids about giving and being generous, I always tell them, I said, the reason I do this, every one of my kids, I sit down with them and teach them on tithing, even as young as five years old. So I do this because it's my way of worshiping the Lord, letting them know he's number one in my life. I let them know that, hey, the man you see today called dad hasn't always been this man. And I've, I've, I've not been this kind of guy my whole life. And this is the way I show God and worship him. So I give, I don't give out of, because I have to, I give thankfully. And lastly, I'll wrap it up with this thought. The fifth thought is this, that we give purposefully. We connect it all back to God. We don't, we don't do it emotionally. We don't do it out of guilt. Second Corinthians says it like this. 
Each of you must decide, verse seven, put it up. For you must each decide in your heart how much to give. Like he said, don't do it reluctantly, talked about this. Like don't do it like emotionally or on the other side, don't do it because you've been connived and you've been worked over in response to pressure. Why? For God loves a person who gives intentionally. Our filter for giving should be we give intentionally because eternity is for real. Heaven and earth are really real places. Eternity matters. And I, last week I was, crazy busy week last week, multiple things. I was in and out of town and Dina was sick last week. My dad's in the hospital, multiple weddings and, and the love of our city was going on in the middle of all that. And I was just really torn and I was all over the place. And so I was up here early in the morning and I went to, couple of the events that you that we did and one of the ones I went to I went to a couple of but one of the ones I went to was a place called Christian Help. And if you don't know anything about Christian Help is Christian Help's a local ministry and they help people on the worst day of their lives. If you don't have a job, you get unemployed, you get a pink slip, like this is the place to go to. They'll help you get a job, they'll help you do your resume. If you don't have food to eat, they'll help you with that. They'll direct you to all the right resources. Incredible ministry. Partner with them, love them. One of our staff pastors is the chairman of the board there. Love that ministry. So I just stopped by there early in the morning to see what was going on with East Coast believers. And I was so blown away that, that, that they had painted the whole outside of this mass, this building, just painted the whole outside. Then they were painting the inside of it. And then I, then I looked over and I, the corner of my eye caught one of the businessmen, a vice president of a local bank here. He was over there raking leaves underneath some bushes. So I walked over and started talking to him. And I, I, almost, I, I almost wanted to say to this, this, this business person, oh, come on, we'll get a young person to, to do that. Like that's too, oh, you, you shouldn't be doing something that low. And God stopped me. God stopped me. And I drove away and I thought, why would we spend, because there's thousands of dollars to do all that stuff. Why? And here's why. Because on the worst day of someone's life, they deserve to go to a place that looks nice, that's clean, so they can feel good about who they are. Because I know at Christian Help, at the end of the day, they're gonna point them back to Jesus. And before they talk about a job, they're gonna talk about their eternity. First Timothy says it like this, by doing this, by, by having these five attitudes, you'll be storing up real treasure for yourselves in heaven. It is the only safe, the only safe investment for eternity. All right? This sixth point, I, I, I kind of back and forth. Do I put this last one in or not? And I didn't want to put it in because we've been so mistaught on this one point. Because for too long we've been taught that you only give to get. And that is not the reason we give. I gave you the five reasons, but there is a sixth point that's really important. Second Corinthians 9 says this, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, but when you give generously, you're gonna, you're gonna reap generously. Here's my last point. You cannot outgive God when it comes right down to it. Let me pray for you. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for every person today here, Father, in our service. I pray, Father, your hand be on them. I pray, Lord, that as we wrap up today, as you're talking to us, Lord, I pray you'd, you would just lead us and guide us when it comes to our generosity, whether it's helping other people for the holidays, whether it's getting involved in whatever areas in our neighborhood, family, friends, missions, whatever it would be, Father. I pray that you would lead us, and I pray that you'd guide us, and I pray that your grace would be on us. In Jesus' name.